We said that we did want to start closer to on time, so we're still a little bit afterwards, but um, we are really listening to you guys and some of the feedback that you've been giving us. And so one of the things that Marty said to you is that we're going to have dinner a little earlier tonight. And so hopefully that might give some of you the little energy you need after working a long day. It might kind of kick you back up a notch, I hope, I hope. So a few more logistical things for tonight in terms of our agenda. I'm going to start just connecting some of these dots that we, we talked last week about co-planning and universal design for learning and differentiation and um, the co-teaching approaches. So kind of just making sure everybody really knew about that. We spent a little bit more time on UDL than the other things. It's all going to fit together tonight. So I'm going to talk about that and just remind you, bring it back up to speed before we take our dinner break. And then uh, we'll have our dinner break. We'll come back. Um, because we're doing Survey Monkey and we're doing the Padlet, those are all ways for us to get some feedback from you, and we do look at that. Another thing that I read was some people some people loved last week and thought it was exactly what they wanted, and they got good strategies, and it helped them to have a structured agenda. Other people said they wanted to work more with their colleagues and hear from each other. Um, others said that they liked the idea of the video that we talked about, and we didn't have enough time. So we're going to do at least one video tonight, and then we have an option for if some of you feel like, OK, I, I want to see more. I'm not as comfortable with the approaches yet. I want to see them in action. We'll have more choice related to that. We will definitely have some more time for you guys to work with each other and get strategies at your own uh, subject area. So those of you in English can talk to other English teachers at other schools, get some more ideas. But again, the goal is that we keep getting strategies and we keep feeling more comfortable in our co-teaching, and that's what we're doing. So the focus today is really co-instruction, just to make sure you guys remember where we've been, because sometimes it's been a long time in between. Co-teaching requires three things. If you're not doing all three things, you're not really, truly co-teaching. What is the first one? Let it co plan and what is the second one? Co instructing and what is the third one? Co assessing. Right. You have to have all three things and it's a recursive loop. You know, you, you assess to figure out what you're going to plan, to figure out what you're going to do, and based on that information, it helps you assess that and plan, et cetera, et cetera. So, last time we talked about planning and getting some tips and some strategies for using your time to plan. But today we're going to talk about how not to step on each other's toes, how to feel comfortable doing stuff that's different with students and really coming up with more strategies for the application of code structure. So, that's the plan. Couple more logistical things, those of you, uh, if you weren't here last time, or you can't remember, you're, you brought a different computer, and you're trying to get online, then please remember this is just for non-Granada people. Uh, it is Granada Guest 1. Should, and it capitalizes the G and the G, so that should bring you online. And the other thing that I put up there, Survey Monkey, is to remind you that so far we've had two Survey Monkeys. Again, this is data that we're collecting. One of them was an evaluation of last week. So that was something for you to go on and say, okay, is this working for you with the topics? Are they not? And that's where we got our feedback to keep tweaking as we go. We'll do that again tonight after at the very end so that you guys can do it immediately on your phones or on your laptops or whatever. And we'll send it out for those of you who don't have that. But the other one was a, a little bit longer was demographic information because we're starting to collect data also on who you guys are. How much training have you already had in your teaching? What are you teaching? How long have you been teaching? Who's your partner? That kind of stuff. So you should have already done two survey monkeys. If you haven't, please let us know. And if you're confused, well, I'm not sure which one I did. Email, you can email Marty. He'll collect the information. If he's not sure, then he'll ask me. Um, and so we'll try and try to get that information to you. So. Uh, Marty, was there anything else logistically from your end that you wanted to make sure they knew? You're it's collecting like information on emails. Uh, What'd you say? It's on the way and so is coffee and dessert as well. Yeah, yeah we're going to break that up tonight. We're going to have food early and then we're going to a little bit later have a coffee dessert break. So that ought to be nice too. Uh, and do make sure that your emails have been checked with Marty as well. Okay, that's I think logistical. Uh, community of practice. Was there a reason, one person noted that, I guess in the very beginning I hadn't clicked that you guys didn't write on the Padlet. So maybe that stopped some of you who went on the Padlet and then realized it wasn't working. And certainly last week when we were here together, it wasn't working for some people. But nobody did the Padlet, so why? You're just busy? Or were there other issues? Just busy? Uh, yes. 
So it wasn't a personal, we hate you, Wendy, so we hate your Padlet, too. Okay, yes? What's it for? Okay. I was able to sign up, I just didn't understand then, now what? Now what, I'm on it. Who cares? Right. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I just didn't really understand what, how to, um, what my process should have been. What the process, okay, good question. So how many of you, does anybody use Padlet in your class? Anyone? Okay, a couple, but they're good. Can you guys share how you guys do Padlet in your class? Because Part of the reason I'm doing this is for us to use it as a community, but for you also to see how you can use it in your classes. Can you guys share? Sure. Thank you. Um, we actually... I know, it's really powerful. <laughs> Sorry. We actually used it yesterday, and we had them um, submit their answers to a homework problem. It was a math problem. They had to create their own linear scenario, and we had them put it all on the Padlet so you can see everyone's on one screen. Awesome. Yay. Anybody else? How would you imagine using it? We got a great math example. Use it for your homework right away. Put up something. Show an application that you understand. Great use of checking comprehension. How else could some of you guys imagine using Padlet? I can tell we're going to need the food. <laughs> How else could you use Padlet? Good, thank you, Lee. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. So just as a teacher, um, I was just worried that I had like, like a tablet as an electronic way of posting things as a yeah. teacher to the classroom. You know, I do it all. But, but you could. I could. That's, that's so fair. That's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of exactly what it is, you guys. If you want to just post something up there so students can find it. Maybe it's a, a mnemonic that you use frequently, or it's a form that they often need to find. Students can use this. Um, I was recently at the California Inclusion Conference last week, and some of the presenters were using it right then for people to post their questions. So now it's behind them, and the people are just posting questions that could be responded to immediately. Also, the presenters, uh, myself included, you just put up forms that you want everybody to be able to get on their own. Yes? We're oh, I'm sorry. I'm just irritated that I can't get on. <laughs> so we're trying to the get password is co-teach. Co yeah, yeah. Tried it multiple times, all caps. Not working. Try it with a large C and the rest not capped. Okay. Maybe it's just it came up here on co-teach. Try it, no caps. We're going to figure this out. Maybe that's the problem. Only the first C is capitalized. Oh, you mean in the Padlet thing? I think they found that, though. You the O is a zero? The O is a zero with the actual How But you got, in which, no, in the co-teach? No, that's not it. They're on the right Padlet. Yeah, they're on the right Padlet. And he said it was a big C and little O. Is that helping? All right, we're going to troubleshoot Padlet so that we can figure out and figure out why people are able to get on. So we'll figure that out. All right. Let's pause for a minute. Has anybody changed? Did you guys get on? Yes. Oh, what was it? Okay, big first C is capitalized, and the rest of it is lowercase. So I'll, I'll change the overhead. Yes, I'm so sorry. There you go. Um, and I will fix that in just a minute. Since last time, have any of you changed, even in your conversation, even if you haven't done any practice, have you changed in your conversation talking about universal design for learning and how you're planning for your co-teaching? Let me hear from a few of you. What is, what's happened between last time and this time? Did you have your hand up? No? Yes? We you just share it? Yeah. I want to hear a little bit from you guys about what are you guys thinking about doing, even if it hasn't been big, baby steps. Um, I just shared with my co-teachers uh, what and how um, and who, Good. like framework, I guess, for planning. Um, we already used to do something like it, but I think that just those three small words helped. Excellent. Be good about stuff, so. Did it help focus your planning a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. Good. So, so if you guys recall, we talked about what, how, who, 
as a way of focusing your time. So first of all, just making sure you know what we're teaching, how are we teaching it, and then who might struggle, who might need some additional support. Uh, we just took one of the lessons that we started at the last meeting and then we talked about different ways to incorporate the types of code teaching in and, and made a lesson plan based on that and who we would address and how we would go about talking or about approaching that and it worked out really well for the students. Uh, tell us what lesson you did and what approaches did you use? We did parallel and, uh, and alternative. Nice. So we kind of divided the class and, and did two different things and we did responded well to it and got more information disseminated to them in a small amount of time. Awesome. I love that. I love hearing that because parallel tends to be the one that high school teachers use the least. Because it's scary to think that two things are going on simultaneously that might be the same stuff. So I love that you guys actually did that, tried it, and yeah, that you disseminate more information in a short amount of time because you're, you can get more people. Who else? What if, what's been happening between last time and this time related to your co-teaching? I can wait a long time. You can talk about struggles too. It doesn't have to be great stuff. What stuff are you doing? Yes, thank you. Okay, you more than anything, just uh, sorry. You got it. looking yeah. up the conversation, again, from uh, the people who are going to be teaching each other the room. No, it actually is like a concrete model. Good. 
That's uh, awesome. The other ones don't have like parallel all that to change our seating because our roads are so compacted a little bit. Um, that's you probably might be a little slow, but the spaces will work out really good. Awesome. Good. And actually, it's it it sounds to me because you have the two groups. And, and even though you guys split, that's still parallel, parallel teaching. teaching. So if it's two groups, it is parallel. If, if you have three or more and they're going through and they might be independent or not, so you guys hit it. But honestly, you all, I don't care if you make up your own name for it, you know? It's the goofy approach. I don't care if you're doing it. And what I like is I also heard you had video, you had a smart word, you guys are using technology, you got the computers going, and then they're even thinking proactively. Maybe we do this once a month. Maybe at least start with that. That's our goal, or once a unit. That's a great goal. Mel also said uh, back there about thinking, just starting to think about universal design for learning. Starting to think about, do we have more choice? Do we have multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression? All right, another one. Because of everything that uh, was going on with the co-teaching, I was learning more techniques. I was like, I wanted to be more part of the classroom. And Aren't you lucky? Yes. 
Yeah, awesome. Good answer. Um, okay, so what's the one thing? Transformations, obviously there's what you want. What grade? 10? 9? Ten, mostly 10. Mostly 10. So most 10th graders are going to learn everything there is to know about transformations. They're going to love it, obviously, right? They're going to walk away wanting to do transformations every day. But let's just pretend that there are a couple for whom transformation, they, they struggle with that. What would be the one thing that you would want them to get out of that, that every kid, regardless of ability or disability, would absolutely be able to know about transformations? That the size and shape remain the same on the figure. Okay, size and shape remain the same on the figure. Special educators, raise your hand. Special educators, could you find a way to teach every child, think about the caseload, could you find a way to teach every child that transformation is the basic thing you want them to know is size and shape remain the same? Could you do that? Absolutely. Our students who are in SCC, could you do that? RC? Yeah. We can do that. Now, can they apply the formula? Can they figure out the answer to that? You know, maybe not. But could they walk away with that? I can guarantee you know that I would be able to do that. So in the what part, that's really important for me to know. I don't necessarily have to get every kid to do all of the homework and all of the problems, but do they know that basic concept? So at least they could move forward with that. We could do that. So that's the what part. That's why it's so important. And then we get into okay, now how? How are we going to teach that? No. What have we done in the past? How do we typically teach transformations? By the way, use a lot of tracing papers. So they're tracing figures. Tracing figures, flipping it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we use Programs online. Programs online. Games. games. So, so what are you guys thinking? thinking? How should Noah and I teach transformations? Come on, yeah, he gave it to us. Come, what is it? Yell it out. Stations. That's, that's a no-brainer. So here's what I'm thinking. Why don't we start off, Noah, and maybe we do a little team teaching in the beginning. Like we'll do a modeling, right? Maybe even a role play. Do you have a good sense of humor? Protect. Mild. Yep. <laughs> we'll just do something that's mildly fun. Um, but what if we stand up front and we kind of joke around about how I'm just so stupid and, you know, oh my God, I'm blonde. And I will get transformations and I keep trying to change it and they're like, it's just the same. Like, do something so we model for two minutes in front of them about you trying to dumb it down for me and make it super easy, okay, just the same. Then let's have stations where the students are going to go around and they're going to do transformation practice in three or four or five different ways. They're going to have technology, they're going to have kinesthetics. How about you sit at one of the stations, Noah, and you actually do direct instruction on it. I will walk around and I will facilitate the rest of the station, just making sure people are doing the right things on the computers, that they get it. So you'll just stay there. So every time they get they go around, and then they we do alternative at the end, where we have done an assessment. We've seen who's getting it and who's not. I'm getting a sense as they walk around. So for the last five to seven minutes, while well, you have a large group to kind of do a wrap-up, figure out, you know, tell them what they're doing next, what the homework is, I'll take those couple kids we said, wow, they still don't get it, and I'll take them somewhere and just do a really quick reteach of transformations. Not going to give them the same amount of homework because they don't get it yet, so maybe we just have a couple that they're really going to practice to make sure they get it. Can we do that? How long did it take us to plan that lesson? Maybe five minutes, right? Now. We, we have gone great detail, but now we have a general idea. And so I'll look over those stations and make sure, do, gee, should we make an adaptation? Now we get into, because we figured out how, what the co-teaching approach is. We're going to think about there's multiple means of representation, right? That's how we teach it. What are the multiple means of representation that we already have built in? Okay, well, they're, they're doing movement. That's the process, right? That's the engagement part. But what about the representation, the, the teaching of, of it to them? We've got some visuals. What else? Okay, we've got some kinesthetic movements and tracing. What else? We've got traction. He gets a lecture, right? But he's just going to do it with smaller groups, and we're going to tell him to keep it down to seven minutes or whatever we've got. Okay, so we've got multiple ways. We've got technology. Right? And, and so, so that also the input, the representation, is also part of the engagement. They're going to be much more interested because we're going to go around and, and maybe we can add in, you know, colors or different interesting shapes. You know, I'll, I'll ask you or defer, you know, as we look at shapes, is there some way we can build in their interest? 
Okay, and then in terms of even the expression them showing us how they've got it, maybe we could have like one problem that they're doing when they're with you and one problem at one other station that we're collecting as an assessment. And that's how we determine who comes to me at the very end. But that's super easy. So again, we've got multiple means of engagement, expression, and representation. It's more motivating because they're moving, they're doing stuff differently, but they're still all focused on, tra on uh, transformation. And now, Based on what we've just said, you guys, who might struggle? You don't, you don't throw out names, you don't know the names, but where might there be areas that you can anticipate a student having a problem with transformation based on what we just did? Why? Okay, a student who is, is an English language learner. Uh, okay, so she's saying there might be academic language that is going to put some of our English language learners at a disadvantage. So right from the get-go, Noah, when we do our cute little one and a half minute role play, let's make sure we front load the word transformation and transform and change transformers, robots in disguise. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, but let's just do that because we're thinking academic language. Now, are they going to struggle with academic language in the stations? Depends on how much language we have. So far, I'm thinking they're tracing, they're listening to someone, they're watching a video, they're doing a game. Doesn't sound like a lot of language already. So as long as we front load a couple of those key words, we should be good. All right, what else? Where am I going to struggle? Yeah. Visual processing. Okay, so we might have a kid with visual processing deficits. Where do you think they might struggle in that lesson that we come up? is really difficult. So she's saying if you have a visual processing deficit, in and of itself, the concept of transformation might be a problem. So that's great. So us going up here, we just did it visually, which is what a lot of teachers do, is I'm going to show you one of look, I'm going to move it and turn it. And that's enough. And you should be able to do it. And we know they're going to struggle. But have we been figuring that out? Have we been thinking about that in our stations? Are we going to address that? The fact that we've got kids who, who if it's just visual, they're not going to be able to get it? What are we doing? We're going to make sure that we have some kinesthetics up that they have to physically move themselves. We're going to think about those games and really look at them and say, now wait a minute, are these just going to be visual games or is there going to be a way that they're going to be able to maybe have some manipulatives at the stations that otherwise would be purely visual? Let's bring some extra things. Not that everybody has to use them, but if at that game center, if you're sitting in front of the computer, maybe we'll have a little folder where if they want to have a couple examples to physically flip and check, they can do that. Not everybody needs it, but a few will need it. What's another place you might struggle? Oh, go ahead. You have another idea now. Well, just an observation. Uh, the observation is that as a general education teacher, some of the things you mentioned, uh, I have to acknowledge I would be blind to it. I wouldn't see it. And that's the beauty of having that's someone great. who's better trained in uh, looking for these kinds of things, looking over the lesson and saying, wait a minute, we're missing A, B, C, et cetera. All the things that you Exactly. Can. That's the perfect uh, rationale. Mel just said, you know, as a general educator, I might have been blind to this. So just the fact that you said, oh, let's think about the academic language, and certainly not just kids who are English language learners, but there are other students who will struggle with the language. Yeah, we front loaded that. And that we thought about visual processing deficits. Great. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's why we're co-planning. We haven't changed anything. Noah, does this sound like a lesson that would be doable in your class so far? For sure, right? But instead of you saying, oh, I have all these different strategies, and maybe we all do the tracing, and now we all do a game, and now we all, we're just mixing it up a little bit and putting in some of these strategies to help more students be successful. What's another potential issue? Yeah. Oh, I'll come right there. OK, so molar skill issue, let's think about the manipulatives. Are they going to be cutting? Do we need to think about different kinds of scissors? Uh, do we need to have something that's thicker so that they can physically pick it up instead of just a flimsy piece of paper? So let's think about potential motor issues. Universal design means you don't wait to find out if a student has this. You just have some options. I happen to know a student who doesn't like to cut. Maybe not a physical disability, but really just doesn't do well with it. Um, so oh, that's having that advance is great. Let's try and get another one. Yeah, retention. Retention, yeah. Steps or 
Remember the concept? Good, just, just retaining. Raise your hand if any of your kids have struggles with retention. Do they all have disabilities? Of course not. Of course not. So what do we do? Given that, what, given that our kids have struggles with retention, what could you guys do? What's the strategy? One of the strategies that we can use is... I'm going to give you this, sir. Go ahead. One of the strategies that we have to have our cards available and tell them, okay, we're going to write this concept up. Or you don't write it in your notebook or on the page just going on the kind of situation. We teach you to do skills. So, you know, we have to have that set. Okay, I want you to bring these steps, you want to put these in the notes, circle it, put uh, a code on it, okay. highlight it, or something like that. We'll do it back on the family where you know what we want to highlight the family words. Also, there's different steps that we use as far as having them retain different things, like boy man does it. Right. Right yeah, yeah, good. So just keeping in mind, like, having them create a checklist, having them create a three by five card, they can walk around with that. I'm just going to talk really loud. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so it's, it, it's not about just being loud. Honestly, it's because we're recording this, so it helps, it goes straight to the. Um, in the past, I co teach with Mo, and I was new to Algebra 2, and she created something called a toolkit. Ooh. And whenever something new was introduced, we took like the formula or the steps to the problem, and we had it, and we put the notes, and I no longer go teaching with Mo, but I still. Use my toolkit. Nice. Love that. If anybody wants to come over and see the toolkit at some point, come over. But having that kind of strategy is fantastic. So again, knowing that students struggle with retention, knowing students, what about the fact that some students struggle with attention and transition? We have a lot of stations going on and some of them are independent. What can you do? I'll repeat the question. Some students struggle with attention, following directions, transition, and we've got stations going on. Yeah, I'm walking around well enough, but I'm not going to be able to do it all. Build in something for me. Are you moving and putting also knowing that station one, you want to do this, and you want to do one, two, and three, 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 Good, so students with autism frequently struggle with transition, right, but it's certainly not just them. If we in advance, give Granada a round of applause for giving us such good food. Although I will say that those people at the very end of the line got a lot less of the meat than a lot of people at the beginning of the line. And no salad. I know, right? No, but there's, there's plenty of rice, plenty of other stuff, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I want to ask for everyone's attention. Thanks. So just like what frequently happens in our classes, uh, people get really busy. And I think a lot of you are right now at a place in the school year where you're extremely busy. And I certainly value that you're here. I think we all do, and we know that we can learn from one another. But it does mean that you're, you're being pulled in a lot of directions. So many of you have multiple things happening right now that aren't just about co-teaching. So let's take a technology break and shut your computers. You, you know, for uh, if you're not a teacher, what they need to hear is you guys really got to close our Chromebooks, which are here. <laughs> Close the Chromebooks, yeah. If, if you're in the middle of your survey and you're trying desperately to get it done, go ahead. But, but that's it, yeah. And those, the rest of you guys, just please keep in mind, we know that you've got a whole lot going on. We absolutely 100% respect your time. But just like we say to students, you get in what you put out. So those of you who have your brain in 17 other places and you've got grading and you've got this and you've got that, unfortunately you're going to miss out on what your colleagues have to say about some really great strategies that will help you in the future. So uh, if you can kind of try and pull on with us, stick with us for another couple hours um, and hopefully the food will give you more energy and not make you fall asleep.
Here's, uh, like I said last time, uh, I got feedback from the evaluations that some people were really interested in seeing co-teaching in action. And I wanted to not just show, I certainly have videos of just co-teaching and happen, doing all things, but I wanted to pull it to our instruction and showing the different approaches and trying to make things um, doable. So I'm going to show you how I had to put my money, uh, put, what is it? Put my money where my mouth is, something like that. Um, could we get the lights? So what's gonna, what I'm going to show you is where I actually did some co-teaching at a high school. This was in West Virginia. You guys would probably notice that if you start to see the size of the classes and you think, oh, that's a special day class. No, in other parts of the country, they don't have as many kids in their state, <laughs> much less their classrooms. Um, and you'll also notice kids dressed for JROTC and things like that. So it'll be a little bit different. Um, I don't think in these particular videos you'll see them talking about um, going hunting, but that does happen frequently. So here's the, here's the background of what you're going to see. I had been working in this particular high school for a little while, helping them with their co-teaching practices. And at one point, someone said, we need to see it. We want you to do it. And, OK, well, that's great. I'll go in and do it if I have a volunteer. And Whitney, who's an English teacher, 10th grade, said she would do it. So I wanted it to be very, very realistic. She emails me and says, well, what do you want to teach? And I said, well, that's not how it works. You have to tell me what you're teaching, like what's coming up. So it's not just what Wendy wants to teach, but it's realistic. So she tells me that what was coming up is they were about to introduce Julius Caesar and watch Juli uh, uh, read the play Julius Caesar. She said most of her kids had never seen a play. They hadn't read a play. They hadn't seen a play. And so for the two days that I was going to be with her, she said her big idea, remember the what, the what she wanted to get across was she wanted them to understand about the use of persuasion because they use oral persuasion a lot in that story and in the play and how back in that day you could tell someone, you know, that person committed a crime and there, there wasn't DNA evidence and there wasn't going to be a jury trial. It was simply going to be one person says they did it, one person says they didn't and you have to see who you believe. So persuasion was really important. Good, that's a big idea I can wrap my mind around I can get kids to learn that. The other thing she said was she wants to talk to them about reading a play, and so the dramatic elements, Aristotle's dramatic elements, was something she wanted to introduce. So that's the information I'm given, and we um, we only lesson planned online because I was I was here in California, she was in West Virginia, and we only lesson planned the first day because again I want to be realistic and I want it to be sort of like second day we got to make this happen let's let's figure out. So first day we did email back and forth for lesson planning, but it wasn't too long. What we ended up coming up with, and I will tell you guys that I had an ulterior goal. My uh, kind of hidden agenda was I wanted to show that you could actually do all five co-teaching approaches in one co-taught lesson, not block scheduled. Do you need to do that? No. no. Should you do that? No. Probably not. But I wanted to show it could be done. So here's what we did. We started the beginning of the lesson just as soon as kids came in. We had to used one teach, one support as our intro. Very quick, I did the lead because the students didn't know me. So I'm, I'm leading it, um, and I'll show you that we also did a strategy in the beginning. But we did that, and then we also did stations as our, just our warm up. So it took us about maybe 10 minutes for our stations. And then I'll explain the strategies, but what we did for color coding is as soon as the students walked in, you'll see this, we're giving out colored index cards to get them in groups. Now, I don't know the students, or I would have been able to be more active, but what you see is Whitney is walking around, and she's handing out colored index cards, and I'm kind of trailing behind her, and whenever she skips a kid, I give them one of the pink cards I'm holding, and that's because we knew we're going to do this activity, the station activity about persuasion. We knew that some of the students, if we started them with writing activity as a warm up, we're, they're gone. They, they will not be interested because we've given them a non-preferred activity. So one of our stations was oral, was just them talking about, oh, one time I persuaded my mom to let me blah, blah, blah. Or one time I got out of a ticket because I, so that's a station. They're going to do oral persuasion. And we thought there's some kids that if they start with that, then they'll know what to write about. So that's a strategy that we built in proactively. Um, so that's our scaffolding persuasion. Also, in one of our stations, we have them writing on index cards, and they have to write, would you prefer to accuse someone of a crime, or would you prefer to defend someone? Why? 
So that's actually the writing activity that she would have had them all do. Instead, they did it as a station, so there's a limited amount of time, and they do it on an index card, which reduces how much they're pr presenting to us. It seems doable, it's just an index card, but then we use it for a later activity. So they've got choice, too, in that one, because they're telling us whether they would prefer um, to accuse or not. And then we also have one where we had positive behavior support. And one of the stations had them just bullet as many times you would need to persuade someone as possible. It could be writing or it could be orally. But they bullet, bullet, bullet as many as they could. And then whoever had the most bullets in that particular station, we did it each time, so just look around, as many, whoever had the most, got a gold star. These are high school kids. Right, so I hear a lot from people, oh, my kids went to, oh my God, they love it. So the kids who have a gold star, now I don't know if I'll see this in the video because it's just one fleeting moment, but at one point you see one of the kids who is clearly a football player, big kid, you know, kind of clean cut looking, and there's another kid who's more grunge, really long hair, kind of, and they, they get eye contact, they see that each of them is wearing a little gold star, and they chest bump. They're like, yeah, we got the, uh, it's just a beautiful moment. Okay, so that's the very beginning of the lesson. Then we got into the middle. Now, uh, Whitney and I do a little role play, which I cannot wait to show you, because that was fun. Um, and we also then broke up into parallel for the majority of the lesson. Role play did not take us very long, but it set the stage. Um, and we had the kids do some pair work. Again, I'll explain as we go through it. Uh, and we used, we tried to use humor, we had visuals, connection to the real world. The students were allowed to pick their partners and they were allowed to come up with a crime that they were going to accuse or defend. So we're building again lots of choice, lots of difference. Sometimes they're individual, sometimes they're partners, sometimes they're small group. We had graphic organizers and we had sheet protectors, all different things. And then at the end, when we, we decided we're going to reteach, we ended up not needing this actually, but we also had that um, we were going to determine based off our two parallel groups who needed more additional instruction in this, have small groups, we had proximity, we were prepared with masks, graphic organizers, and prompts. That's in one period. All right? Okay. Day two, we took it down a notch. Now, how we planned for day two was just based off of day one, we met after school. Um, technically, we met for dinner because I was staying at a hotel and had to meet for dinner anyway. So just during dinner, we planned for the next day. I had to prep my materials at the hotel, so it had to be super doable. Um, and that's when we decided we would start with a warm up. We'd throw out a couche ball, ask them questions about what we did yesterday to pull them back on. I had a magic tablecloth up there for their attendance as they walked in. I had scaffolded the questions, so we had a variety of different levels of questions we were going to ask. We were repeating the key terms to help with that retention, as Strawn had mentioned before. And uh, one of us would be modeling note taking. Again, that's just for the first, say, 10 minutes of class. The majority of class was going to be parallel. Um, I told you that we wanted to do uh, Aristotle's um, dramatic elements of reading a play. N neither of us knew a whole lot about it. That would have been brand new for Whitney. So I said, well, I'll take it. I, I used to act. I, I know something about it. So if both of us are on an equal level of not knowing a whole lot, I'll take that, give me lead, and then she would keep working with the writing that they started the day before, and then we flip-flop groups. So I prepared a lesson for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then I got to do it twice. Um, in terms of the strategies for that, we had differentiated copies of notes for students, and then I was supposed to teach them how to read a play. I told you, how many of them had seen a play? None. None, because in height. In all six of her classes, I think like she had had two kids who had ever been to a play, um, or five of her classes. So if you're trying to get kids to understand a play, what would you compare it to that you're pretty sure they'd know? What did you say? What goes around comes away? Yeah, the Kaiser Permanente, they come around. Talking about STDs. Oh my, STDs. <laughs> Wow, okay. Um, I don't know why, but I didn't go there. Um, <laughs> but if I ever teach it again, I might consider that. Uh, what about the rest of you? Movies. Movies, and that was what I did. So I just went, again, I'm in a hotel room. I have a limited amount of time. And I'm just Googling some of the main movies. Actually, the day before, as our ticket out the door, they had to write down what they thought about the lesson, first of all, because I was collecting data, and then what their favorite movie was. And they're like, this is our ticket out the door? Yeah. So when we were doing this, this was a few years ago, um, the big movies were like Twilight and The Hangover and things like that. So I could talk about theme 
and do, when you're doing Twilight, what's the theme of Twilight? Love, right? And some of you are like, I know it, but I am refused to admit it. Um, all right, so love, it's, that's not the plot. But the plot of The Hangover is, people take a baby to Vegas, right? They, they all knew it. So anyway, we, we go over that. And then, um, so I visual scrapped a organizer, and then their ticket out the door was they had to find a partner. Um, and we'll just, I think I'll be able to show it to you. We have a magic tablecloth with some of the key words that we had just taught them about theme and plot and, um, you know, all the visuals and stuff like that. Okay, so that's it. Let me just go straight to some of the, I'm just going to be skipping through things just to give you, just to explain some of the stuff that's going on. So the first thing you're going to see in this clip is where I'm explaining the stations that they're about to do. Keep in mind, they know Whitney, they don't know me, so I'm having to take a lot more lead so that they hopefully trust me. Um, hang on. So we also thought about visually connecting. If you've got a yellow card, you're going to start in the yellow station. If you're a pink card, you start in a pink station. So it's easy for them to walk around. They also kept those cards as they walked around. And then when they got to the station about writing, they wrote on that card. So we've already managed materials to limit how much they have to do. And then as you notice, I just said, if you finish that station, leave your card there. There's a folder. And that's when we collected the writing that said, do, do you want to accuse or do you want to defend? And then we'll use that for grouping for parallel later. That's Whitney standing next to me. I have lost my, there it is, where to go? Oh. If you start the station pink, well, then you have to go over there and feel what you get over here. You're going to write your answer and leave it in the folder. So every time you have that station over there, you write your answer and leave it in the folder. Do it see again in the far left hand corner, you see that it is also written what they're doing. So we have three different things for different representation. In one station they're talking, one station they're bulleting, one station they're writing. So we felt like we have a variety of different things all about persuasion. Then what happened, I don't know if that comes up, we, we were clear on how much time, when, how we're going to cue them to transition and then they get to the transition. Um, I didn't want to show everything but what will happen next is with those cards, Remember, I don't know them so well. So I go up in front of the class, and I'm, ex I'm talking to them about um, Julius Caesar's time. I'm doing a little one teach, one support. What's happening in the support role is Whitney's taking those cards. She knows the students. And she's dividing them into the accuse and the defend, but then you know, balancing it out to make sure that we will have two equal groups for parallel teaching. Then we say, OK, guys. She, she stands up and she pairs them up and says, okay, this person accuses, this person defend. She partners them with someone they Two. One. Thank you. Okay, so I just went and looked at what some of you guys wrote because obviously uh, I had a group up here doing videos. And so before I tell you what, what I saw, what I, my reflection, I'd like to hear yours from uh, people who were either in small groups or people who came up for videos. What did you get out of it? Uh, 
Did you see anything, learn anything, discuss anything? Well, watching the videos kind of confirms kind of some of the stuff that you can do. Maybe kind of look at some better things to do, some of those things to different, or add to what we're doing a little bit, like the alternative teaching where uh, we had a little small group. We, well, we were kind of identifying uh, kids in our class, maybe they were really benefit from that, and maybe using uh, you know, the PLL, the PLL person that comes in and monitors the kids, yeah. getting her more involved with that. Great. Give her a lesson and teach that and monitor that in. Uh, so, yeah, I, I saw some stuff there that it was good. Um, good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Really so, I don't know. I don't know if all of you heard that. Um, they're very excited about the idea of doing cowboy hats and wigs. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing Strawn in that too. Um, <laughs> so they were doing role play and stuff like that. But, but I do think one of the things that he said, those of you who weren't part of the videos, still, this is something you can get out of that. He said he was even thinking about how there's an individual who's in charge of kind of looking at English language learners who comes in. A lot of times we have speech language pathologists. We have people working, I'm gonna just stop for a minute. It's not just you. Thank you. We have a lot of individuals who come in for different purposes. Individuals who are there because there's a child with a moderate to severe disability in your class. Individuals who are there because of speech and language or school psychology or ELL or GATE. We've got a lot of extra people and we frequently don't think about them and what their role could be too. Just because the two of you are co-teaching doesn't mean you couldn't invite them to co-teach with you. And it could be part of it. So just the idea that you say, oh, when there's somebody else who comes in, maybe that person could be part of this too. Maybe we could build that in so they're not just doing their thing with their kid. Okay, so that was something. So they, they love the idea of role playing with hats and they like the idea of using other people. Um, it was really helpful to see the different ways um, that Tyrell is teaching them up because yeah. I think in my mind it's just I've had like blinders on, so it's one way of good looking. And so it was really helpful to me to get creative with space and noise. Good, I'm glad. Yeah, I think they saw like three different ways that parallel teaching could be set up and, and sometimes kids are up and standing and sometimes they're, you know, kind of clustered really close together. We talked about how if you're worried about noise that maybe one of the groups could be doing something that doesn't involve speaking. So that's helpful. Did you have your hand up? You wanna? No? Just up there. All right. What else? Somebody else. Good. I get two over here. That's excellent. Oh, good. Oh. Here you go. Go ahead. I stuck over here with an English group. I'm a science teacher, but I was over here with the English group. And it was really great to talk about Hamlet and different ways and strategies of co teaching. And I don't know, for me, it was, I was thinking of all the different things they were writing and there's role playing and debates and just the cross curricular, the different ideas of how to take what they're doing in English and apply it to what I'm doing in science. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really, it was just really cool. So I, I enjoyed it. And some of their ideas was. Things I think I, we can apply to our science class. Very cool. I liked in the video where after the parallel talk, it came together, they like to rock it together. I thought that was a good idea, like an SMTD type of situation. So um, I, I got something from that. Good, I'm glad. And as a strategy for that, he's talking about that they just ask questions. So one of the ways to do that is you know what you're going to teach that day. Just type up questions that you think, I, I would want students to be able to answer these questions. And maybe scat go from easy to hard. Type them all up, and then you've got them for all the future. And then all you have to do is cut them up, and they, they're just taking these questions, but because it looks like we took them on pieces of paper, and we put them in a hat or a box, and we pull them out. Again, it just looks like, ooh, now it's different and it's a game. Instead of, here are the questions that you have to answer, or you have to do this ticket out the door that seems more formal. It made it, made it more interesting. I also told the uh, group that was with me that I, one of the things I loved about this particular team is they wanted to reward students. They, now they had middle school students, but they were rewarding them. And when they were rewarding them, you know, that can get expensive if you're thinking, oh, I have to buy candy and soda and, you know, tickets to movies or whatever. So instead, they had a box and they had just created this culture of 
anything could go in the box. So it could be a like chewed up pencil that they found on the ground, or a broken dog toy, or whatever. And they would throw it in the box, and the kids would get to be like, oh, we're gonna throw the box, and they they would come and like, Barbie without a head, yeah. And the kids loved it. It was just, and it cost them nothing. And then students were bringing in junk to put in the box, but they, but that was, woo, I get to get it. So it's kind of fun. All right, what about those of you who are working? Now, when I walked around, I noticed a real variety. Some of you were just saying things like, we could use parallel, we could use stations, we could do you know, these different things. And that's great, but I really appreciated seeing very concrete things, like we could use parallel teaching for perpendicular lines versus parallel lines. To me, that, that's what I was going for, is that kind of concrete, here's a lesson, and here's how we could teach it. Or when they said Hamlet over there, and we could have stations doing plot, we could have another one doing theme, we could have another one doing figurative language in Hamlet, we could have somebody else doing that. That's a really concrete thing you walk away with. So what are some other ideas, either that you're having right now or that you've had just from this, of, oh, wait, that's how we could do it. We've been, um, we've been alternative learners. And we've been just working here on how we as a team could actually um, could, could teach. Yeah, good. So um, we decided to maybe make stations. I think I'm being a bit more of that. <laughs> That's okay. But, but parallel teaching okay. definitely, um, I would do trans translations and we would do reflections. Yeah. And, um, just yeah. yeah. So, so translations and reflections because students get those confused, and it can be hard. So, just even as a student with a disability, the fact that I'm remembering what did you teach? Oh, that was translations, and you gave me a lot of different ways to translate language and translate my um, figures and da da da. Oh wait, you reflected and you talked about reflection. And just in my mind, as I'm looking at my test, I'm thinking, who taught me that? What did they teach me? What were the strategies? So that kind of thing, chunking, helps students remember it. So that would be a great parallel teaching lesson. All right, what else? <laughs> it's like the half hand, do I have to? Somebody has to save her, I'm a teacher, I'm willing to help, I'll take it. <laughs> One of the really nice things about talking with English teachers and having Marty come and help us was seeing a lot of the issues, like I think every subject feels you know, unique, but I think with English, a lot of the fun stuff is so subjective that it's hard to do some of those gamey type things. And we were asking for help with Hamlet because I just taught it to my AP kids, but I could teach with her in our C class, and they're very unconscious. <laughs> so we don't want to be as fun, because if you have too much fun, they get too crazy. Mm. So we were talking about like, how to keep it academic and, and getting some ideas, that's good, that's great. Um, I do think that sometimes we, we pare it down because we're so afraid the students will take it overboard, but remember that that's part of it's, it's structure, right? The more structure, but sometimes the getting up and getting doing stuff, then they're actually engaged in doing something. Um, is not this group, this group is different. Oh, all together, super fun. Um, <laughs> Example, for Hamlet, but this would go for all of you guys, if you have kids who have difficulties with sequencing, so remembering what happened first in Hamlet, what happened second, what happened third, or uh, what happened the problem solving, like what do I have to do first step, second, third, scientific method, social studies could be like remembering wars, this happened, then that happened, whatever. I do something called contemporary timeline. So you simply take a string, right, and you can do it as one co-teacher team against another co-teacher team. So I take a student, you take a student, we hold a string, and then I've got this half of the room, you've got that half of the room. Uh, each group, you can do it with multiple groups if you want to, but each group gets a, an envelope. And in the envelope are a bunch of paper clips and sentence strips. You can also use index cards. And on each sentence strip, and again, it's super easy. You type up the steps, you print them out, you cut them, or you have somebody else cut them. Then you've got them, you stick them in the envelope, and then you say, go. And then each, each kid gets one, and then they have to negotiate where it goes on the, the string, that they have to clip it on in the order. And so teachers can say, okay, um, all right, come on team, come on team, you know, and there's two wrong, you don't tell them which two. 
And as a group, they have to communicate and figure out how to put it in the right order until it's correct. And then you say, you know, you got it. They get to run up, ding the bell, and see which team won. So it's a game, but it's reinforcing having them practice doing that. So that's, that's kind of activity. Let me give you a couple more strategies, and I'm hoping this will get you guys thinking about your strategies for co-instruction. First of all, when we're planning, this links to the planning, but divide roles. Figure out what you're good at. Like I told you with the Wendy and Whitney thing, we just divided and said, look, you know, I'll prep, when we did the stations, I said, I'll prep the pink, where it was an oral thing, and I'll prep the one that we're um, doing bullets. And she prepped the one where they were going to be writing the thing. So, so we divided that. When we said we were going to role play, we simply said it'll be a, um, a crime. She'll come up with a crime. I just have to defend. That was the end of our planning on that. But think about what you're good at, what you bring to the table, and try to then be consistent about that. Students will get to realize you always do the warm up, or somebody else always does the cool down, or you always come up with the creative vocab strategies. But then you know your role, and you won't have to keep figuring out who's going to do it this time. You just know. That's your role, and you're cool with it. Um, another one is classroom strategies, and this kind of goes back to what you were saying, is when we have a lot of kids with special needs, our behavior can be a nightmare. So what concrete strategies are you using, not just proximity control? What are some things some of you guys have done that you think really works in your class to help with behavior? I hope there are a few of you. <laughs> Come on, tell me some. I got one, then I got two. So depending on the student um, in stations, utilizing that student as a leader in one of those stations to kind of give them that role to help keep them engaged so that baby doesn't come to issue. Excellent. So one of the things we know about stations is that um, if you look at the Johnson & Johnson research on cooperative learning roles, we know we're not supposed to get a group together and just say, okay, do it, because one kid's going to be like, I'll just do it all so it's right, and everybody else is like, sweet, you do it. Instead, we give them roles. And now, being very thoughtful about who's got the role of facilitator, giving them that leader position, if that's a student who you know the function of their behavior is attention from peers. So here's one of the things that I do. I have roles that I know I always use. Facilitator, recorder, reporter, timer, cheerleader, uh, consultant, materials manager. So I have those on cards, and I have the cards laminated and different colors. So I have them in a file, and I know that any time we decide, even if it's a last minute, like, you know what, today's lesson is bombing, let's get them in small groups. If we, even last minute, we'll have those and we can still give roles to the kids. And so being thoughtful about ooh, who should we make the leader, the facilitator, because that kid needs attention, is a great way. And that's a strategy that you guys can build in proactively. Um, another strategy for behavior. About we use little points, they're just little pieces of paper. And we go around and the kids are on task or answer your questions, volunteering to read, whatever, following the class rules in general. We give equal points. And what they do at the end of the week, we have a big spinner and we let them spin to show prizes. And we set up a, a criteria, not criteria, how many points uh, you have to have. You know, I just spend like 20 equal points. The kids are only in the class maybe with us two periods a day, but they only have to do maybe five equal points. We modify it. But anyway, it seems to motivate the kids. So they all want to get points. They go there Saturday and Friday, speak Fridays. They spin. And some of the things they can do is be teacher for the day or choose the game that we're going to play. So things like that. And we. Um, do that also each grading period. We have an economy kind of thing going on, the budgeting. Do you want to spend your equal points weekly, save mm. 10 points, or do you want to save them up? Because each grading period, you save them, there will be double points, but we give out a reinforcement survey to find out what they want, and then they can save it and spend it each grading period they get and buy a So that seems to motivate our students to stay on task and mm -hmm. do their work and have very nice. And that's, again, something that if you use this for your whole class, it doesn't feel like I'm only doing it for you because you need a token economy and nobody else. For those of you who are concerned about extrinsic reward versus intrinsic reward, um, how many of you are here because you're super happy that you get paid and you get dinner? I mean, admit it. In addition, in addition to the content, in addition, isn't that a bonus? It is a bonus. So while her, your 
students are clearly motivated about the content, and they would do it anyway because they love your content so much, it doesn't hurt to get an eagle point. I mean, all of us have things, so it's really, for, you don't want only extrinsic rewards ever, but it's the idea that you're building in a way, certainly no, most of our kids are working for grades, that's extrinsic, right? So the kids who are not motivated by grades, building in points is fine, especially if it's not just, here's a candy, here's a candy, like they're a little, you know, animal or something and we're throwing them food. I like the idea that you have to wait for a little bit and then you can scaffold that. For some kids, they might get a point that day and others you, you're able to wait because they have that control that others don't, so great. Um, one of the things, or a couple things that I put up there, have any of you ever had a time when you're in the middle of the most brilliant lesson ever given, ever, and you've got that kid who clearly is into it with you? And they're like this because they want to participate. And you throw it to them like, yes! And they say? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ever? Oh, wow. oh, okay, so annoying. So one of the things that I learned that I have to have my students, all my students know and my, my co-teachers know, is we do this. We do the sign language for toilet. And that way they, you know, if they're looking at me like this, I know it's not my brilliance that they want, it's the bathroom. Right? So teach your students to do sign language so at least you know what they're, they're asking and then you can choose a yes or no. Or have bathroom cards where they get a certain limit. Um, for those of you who are trying to figure out the, the hand signal, put your hand up. Everybody open hand. You're putting your thumb between your first and second finger and then you're shaking it because that's a T in sign language and it's toilet. Don't do the R thinking that, oh, I'm, I'm saying restroom. You're saying ready. So ready for what? Go potty. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So having little little signals. Um, here's another signal. Now, Marty, let's see if you remember what our signal is. So Marty and I have co-tie, and it will surprise you both. Uh, surprise you all, I'm sure, to know that he and I both tend to talk a lot, and we both tend to say, we both tend to um, tell very long stories. So instead of what most people would do, which is Right? Because everybody sees that. It's clear that you're telling your partner, okay, shut up. We came up with our own one. What did we do? Absolutely. Absolutely, Marty. Absolutely. So when either one of us goes, right, so I'm telling the story and he's back there going, absolutely, Wendy. He is not agreeing with me. <laughs> he's saying, move on. So we've had a lot of absolutely. So that's just a, that's a little thing that he and I worked up that's a little bit different. All right, another one. Be ready to jump in. You never know what's going to happen, so make sure that when you guys are planning, make sure that when you guys are planning, it's not, okay, you've got that part, and then I never know what you're going to do, because inevitably, that's the time your partner's going to be called out. And if you're on your own, you're like, I, I can't do this part, I didn't plan for it. You don't have to lead it, right? Your partner can completely plan it and be ready to lead it, but they need to at least let you know the big idea and give you copies so that you're ready, where if the phone rings and there's an emergency, you can jump in and do it, and vice versa. So that's really important. Um, and then think about FaceTime. What I hear from a lot of high school teachers, special ed teachers say, I don't know the content. So even when we started up where you said, hey look, you know, we were doing, it was pre-calc, right? Pre-cal, you're like, look, I'm good with algebra too, but not so much pre-cal. Well, if you have to stick with that, I would say find ways to get FaceTime that aren't doing the new content that you don't know. But you could do a warm-up, right? You could talk to kids about the agenda. You could say, all right, now let's, let's apply what we just learned. I can ask questions. I can do the, the cool down or uh, homework or something. So get as much FaceTime as you can, even in the times when you don't know a lot of content, because that will help prepare you for the next time you know more content. And then also think about the beginning of the semester. Guys, I know we're not in the beginning of the semester anymore, but for those of you who haven't done that or are taking notes about future, one of the things I like to do is the Configuration Olympics. Does anyone know what that is? No? Okay, so here's what you do. So we've talked about the co-teaching approaches, right? So everybody remembers them? Good. I think about my classroom. One of the things some of you have said is it's in like the parallel having to seeing different ways you can set up your room and kind of getting more ideas. So what you do is think about your classroom and all the different configurations you might be able to do. 
you put up big, use big pieces of paper and then draw those or have somebody draw. But if like configuration one might be all the rows. Everybody just in their individual seat rows, that's configuration one. Configuration two is if I want you guys to get pairs. So it shows how you just move your chair to the other chair, we've got pairs. Configuration three, we're getting in groups of four. Configuration four, I want parallel, and it could be facing forward and back. Configuration five, parallel, but it's facing side and side. Configuration six, blah, blah, blah. You draw physical representations of what your room could look like in a variety of different ways. Now, the Olympics comes in that we practice it. So it's the beginning of the year, and I say, all right, configuration three, go. And you've got a stopwatch, go. And the kids have to move their chairs, and it's really loud and obnoxious to the classes next to you, so that's fine. But they move their chairs, and they get there, and then you see how long, and you usually say things like, that was really good, you guys did it in 16 seconds. Of course, period two did it in 14, but you guys are still good. And then they want to beat period four, so they you know, try to do it faster. So um, you just practice all the different configurations. That way, throughout the year, as they walk in, all you have to do is say, we're in configuration five today. And they move their chairs into configuration five, which also helps if you have different things for different periods. So if in period one, it's configuration five, but for the rest of the period, you want something else. As soon as they walk in, they move their chairs again to the right configuration. Wait, I'm going to have you do this. Oh, Thank sorry. you. I have a colleague that was brilliant that did something similar, but he would use visuals. So he would draw like uh, four squares and they go into groups of four. Like he didn't even have to talk, but I mean he could. Perfect. But so I mean that, I, I love that. Especially it's, if you're a weaker voiced person. I, I tell a lot of the teachers, like try to use transitions that are not yeah. verbal, but have some, you know, if they can. It's perfect. And that's why, I mean, I like having, I, I mean, and I, I've done this in all my classes. I had the pictures up around the room so that if I said configuration four, or I could have probably just done this as they walked in the door, they look up, they've got a visual to remember because I have so many different ways I want my room. So sometimes it was standing, like your chairs stay there. But then you have little stick figures like clustered along the wall. So I mean, a variety of different ways. Did you have your hand up? Does somebody have their hand up over here? Oh, you did. Okay, excellent. I'm glad you like that idea. Um, all right, and then, the other one is fair does not mean equal. Now, I know you guys know this. I know this is not new for sure. Uh, Rick LaVoy made it really popular in the 80s. But how are you guys teaching this to students so you don't have them saying that's not fair when they see you doing something different for different kids? What are you doing to teach them that? Nobody actually teaches it. You just say, shut up, equity. deal with it. Equity. You teach them about equity. Tell me what you do. Well, I mean, that, that visual that I think we've all seen around, right? Like, um, okay, so equal, three different heights, right? So actually over the fence. So equal, you give them the exact same height box, and like the shortest leg um, height can still see over, right? You're giving them the equal boxes. Equity would be giving the taller box to the shorter person, they can still see over, and then the, uh, the right side box to the others, right? So basically, giving um, what they need, right? Being responsive and adaptive rather than just equal equity, giving them what they need. And let me see what will happen. Um, I have another thing that I, I read about over the summer and I loved it. Um, you give a handful of students, like on the first day of school, uh, a card with an ailment on it, and so they come up to you, you're supposed to be like the doctor, and they tell you what's troubling them, and you just give everybody a Band-Aid. And uh, of course, for some people, Band-Aid's not enough. And so it's not about being fair. Well, I'm fair, I gave everybody the same exact thing, but uh, I <laughs> uh, that's not what everybody needed. Awesome. This is the one I was yeah, I'm about to put it up for everybody. I've got it. So, <laughs> I love, love, love that you did this and we didn't even plan it in advance. This week on Thursday, I was the keynote speaker at the California Inclusion Conference. And so, one of the things I did was talk about equity in a world wanting equality. So, those of you who want this idea, go to Pinterest. Pinterest is fantastic and it will give you the whole thing about how to do this activity with students. Um, so we have, oh, we have a whole bunch of different examples. Oh, here's, try this one. Could you please shovel the ramp? 
The guy says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And the student says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So show, show that visual. Have a conversation with them. Um, here's a department store story. Do you guys know this one? Mom goes into a department store with two little kids. They're twins. It's going to be their first dance ever. So she buys the little girl the cutest dress. It's got, you know, it's fluffy and it's got ribbons and it's got lace and it's got bows for her hair. She's got a little purse. She's got matching little shoes, glitter, bling. It's awesome. They start to leave the department store. And the little boy says, that's not fair. You didn't give me anything. So she buys them the same outfit. Could your kids have a, I'm glad you like that. <laughs> could your students have a conversation about that? Of course they could. They would easily be able to say he wanted something different but equal. So you can have that. At the high school level, a lot of times what I've done is a sports story. So I talk about, you take this kid from Malibu. He is a surfing expert. But he moves to Maine. And in Maine, they all ski. And so his buddies are like, oh my god, you got to come up here. They take him to the Black Diamond Ski Slope. What is that? Oh yeah, that's a death one, right? Okay, so they take him the best, the best of the best. It's got moles, it's got everything, and he's looking down. Is it equal, is it fair, is it right to make this kid go down the Black Diamond Ski Slope just like all of his friends? No, why not? Yeah, he'll die. That would be that, right? So what could you guys do? What could you do to help this student? He, he, this kid is at the top of the Black Diamond Ski Slope. What could you do to get him down? Take off the skis. Take off the skis. Like, completely alternative kind of activity. He's still going to get down, just not going to do it the same way everybody else did. What's another one? Take him to the bunny slope. So scaffold the instruction for him, please. Let's just let him do the bunny slope and work his way up to the blue and the green and to the black. What's another one? Give, give him a push. You're in it, kid. Good luck. Nice. We'll talk to your process with you later. Okay? What else? Completely change the weight. Now, you're still going to go down, but we're going to make it a little different, so we'll give a snowboard. Let him try with something bigger instead of those thin ones. Follows you. So you lead him down very, very slowly. He can take more time than everybody else, and we're going to show him the path. But he'll follow. What else? Teach him how to fall safely. We've all fallen. It's okay. Give him some more confidence so he can fall multiple times, but maybe he'll learn as he goes. And he won't die doing it. What else? Tell, tell him you lead him in, in, the, in the park. Meet him in the park and just go. Just hang out. I'll be back. Just, just leave him is what I'm hearing you say. That's nice. Peace out, there. Good luck. No, they're scary. All right, so he's saying kind of let him, let him not do this right now. Let him sit out. What else? Hold his hand. So peer support. He could have actually peers around him. You could put him in the largest snowsuit ever. Right? My personal favorite as somebody who learned to ski in Switzerland is very large, very good ski instructors. Preferably male, totally good looking. And then I'm thinking that hand over hand kind of really good scaffolding. <laughs> That's my particular preference for this. Okay, so all of these are strategies for teaching. Fair doesn't mean equal. Uh, we had all kinds of different things that we use for technology. I had a whole game and stuff like that. But this was about the equity, right, for teaching about it. All right, as we wrap up, let me go back to our original one. As we're finishing up here, remember that the way that we're teaching this co-instruction, we've already done this, there's ways, and we'll come back to this next week is about data collection, but there are ways, and we'll go over uh, a bunch of these, that as you're doing these different approaches, you want to build in strategies. And I'll make sure to come back to some of these since we, I was hoping to hear from more of the strategies and throw in my own. I'll build that in next time so we have even more strategies. We'll definitely have the magic table clock coming up. Just to remind you, just to remind you, 
Our next meeting isn't until January. It will be 2017, so you guys have some time to practice really thinking about just set yourselves a goal of trying one, at least one different approach than you've ever used. Next week we're going to be looking at data using the co-teaching core competencies. If I can have everybody's attention, because this is really important. Again, we need to get some of this data. If you look at this, if, if those of you, oops, look at this and then I turn it off. Um, those of you who want to get it done now, so it's not in your hair as you're trying to go back and teach and do all this other stuff, if you want to stay right now and do the evaluation survey, it's on SurveyMonkey, and the new one is at the end. You can see the co-instruct. It's for tonight, an evaluation for tonight. If you don't, we will certainly email it to you, but we're also going to try and remind you that it's not just you'll have this evaluation, but if you haven't done the one that's the demographic information, we really, really need that information. Okay, so your goal, please, is to try to co-instruct with some strategies and different co-teaching approaches. And we'll see you in January. All right, thank you.